The United States has great strength and patience. But if it is forced to defend itself or its allies, we will have no choice but to totally destroy North Korea. Rocket Man is on a suicide. Hello, everybody. Thank you for tuning in to the Liberty Report. With me today is Daniel McAdams. Daniel, good to see you. Congratulations you? on your program this uh, week. You we did two you. programs. Your fans missed you. Oh, I don't it was know. Almost a revolution. They said you did well. You did well. <laughs> glad <laughs> but, you're back, sir. But uh, good to see you. I'm, I'm glad to be back also. And I think that we will talk a little bit, uh, as our introduction indicated, a little bit about that major speech. Uh, it was too bad I wasn't around. I might like to have tweeted during that, that speech. Been I'd have been motivated, I'll tell you, with some of the things that went on. But uh, you have to really search for uh, something really good in it, so uh, we won't pretend to uh, put uh, lipstick on you-know-what. <laughs> no, we can't do that. But, you know, it, it's, it's to me a, a shame because, um, you know, we uh, in, in the libertarian camp, it shouldn't be too difficult to be critical of this aggressive nature uh, of this speech and an aggressive nature of the uh, foreign policy. But I think all libertarians should be concerned about a speech like this. Good constitutional conservatives should be. Yeah. But uh, I, I would think there would be uh, more support coming from the traditional anti-war left, the progressives. But we don't hear a whole lot. We'd get some and we get them on our program. But that doesn't seem to be uh, in the cards yet. But uh, there's, there's lots to talk about in, in this speech, but uh, I don't think there's much reassurance that we're going to be moving in the right direction. You know, fire and fury, it reminds me of shock and awe. Mm -hmm. And uh, shock and awe was going to be, you know, wonderful mission accomplished and all these wonderful things. And, and it, it turned into be a nightmare. So if, if Trump has his way and he feels compelled to live up to his promises, even if it doesn't make any sense, how's it going to be? How's it going be turned not you know in way you can make the case for saying if he does that if he destroys north korea it isn't like getting rid of a regime or something you know a little bit more modest destroys the whole country this could end up a lot worse than uh, the mission unaccomplished in iraq and that unaccomplished mission in iraq and the middle east that's still ongoing and that's been 16 years so but this this has potential greater harm even though if uh, we weren't following this confrontational uh, foreign policy and pr trying to provoke this goofy guy into doing something, yeah. uh, we probably wouldn't have a problem. This seems, it always bothers me, it seems to be so artificial and so unnecessary. Yeah, and if it's just talk, if he's just trying to uh, go up there and sound like a tough guy, it's extremely uh, <clears throat> irresponsible for a world leader to talk that way. But if he's actually serious and he's talking about utterly destroying North Korea, i.e. the country, he's talking about killing 25 million people. And we know the Chinese said just a week or so ago that they will not allow an attack on North Korea uh, unless North Korea attacks someone else first. So if they're true to their word, which they have been so far, uh, they're not going to allow the U.S. to attack. So we're talking about orders of magnitude more than 25 million people. So what exactly does he mean by this? Well, he can't possibly mean it. <clears throat> I have to confess, I made a uh, wrong assumption of, or a hope uh, that I thought the speech would be much more uh, toned down, more in the uh, spirit of what he did at the State of the Union message, because uh, even even some of his enemies say, "Hey, that's at least a, a little bit better tone." I thought he I thought he would take advantage of this, uh, but it seems like he thrives in this. This uh, you know provoking. Uh, I, I think that if he doesn't provoke somebody, he's not satisfied. I think this is a personality quirk that he has that he needs this for some reason. And uh, he gets a sense of power from this if he can provoke you. If he, if he doesn't provoke you, just think of the very first night of the first debate. Yeah. You, you know, uh, with Megyn Kelly, it was provoke, 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 and it was so successful. You know uh, that he gets all the attention. So this had a lot of that spirit in there. It's provoking, and uh, he throws in a few words. You know, this is national sovereignty. We're for national sovereignty. Of course, I'd like the national sovereignty to be uh, there to protect individual sovereignty and individual responsibility. He talks about it, but then he mixes it in with the nation state. 
And that, that makes me a little bit nervous about the, the power of, of the nation state where you co combine the state itself with the cultural and ethnic uh, uh, portions of, our, of, of a country. And I think that approach is almost a, a theocracy uh, and also that some of the bad regimes around the world over the centuries have been those who called themselves a nation state. And uh, that he, his, his argument is that the nation's responsibility is to enhance the quality of the people. And uh, yet, for me and so many, you know, the, the, the people, the human condition he talked about, is, can only be enhanced by the, the people. That's why I find a limitation on what I advocate, uh, you know, with limited government. Because ultimately, if the people aren't mature enough and understanding enough and assume responsibility for themselves, you know, no matter what you do in government, you can't make people do that. So people have to understand what liberty is and respond in a positive way. So I have, uh, that, that was sort of buried in his speech about the human condition, uh, but uh, it just once again fits into the category of using an authoritarian approach to improve the, the human condition. Of course, we could argue we want to do that too, but we want to do it with freedom, you know, free markets and sound money and limited government and staying out of war. That would improve the human condition. I don't think he's quite with us on our approach on how to improve the human condition. And the roadmap to that is subsidiarity, which is the opposite of what he's talking about. I think a good argument could be made that the human condition was probably better off when there were hundreds of little uh, mini kingdoms around Europe, you know, when the, the person who you were responsible to was was right there in your village or something of like this rather than some far away Washington, D.C. Right. But you know, with uh, <clears throat> a couple of things really stood out and, and, and almost, I would say didn't pass the laugh test, but I didn't laugh because it wasn't funny. But you talk about the U.S. with a global military empire with thousands of military bases in a hundred and some countries uh, involved in so many wars and conflicts, regime changes, overthrows. And how do you, how do you put that side by side with what he said here? Strong sovereign nations let diverse countries with different values, different cultures, and different dreams not just coexist, but work side by side on the basis of mutual respect. It's almost as if he's deranged. Yeah, and uh, of course, his um, opposition to the UN supposedly really is a facade too, because uh, I think all our presidents uh, for a long time have used the UN, and it's not like they run roughshod over us. There was a time when I believed that was the case that we were paying for everything, and they were always picking on us. But I don't, I don't believe that anymore. I think we've used the UN. If we want to put on sanctions, we rush to the UN and we badger and we get the vote. Almost always, if we want support for an invasion. Uh, I remember so clearly the Persian Gulf War uh, when uh, when H.W. Bush said that, well, we need to go in. And they said, well, you don't have authority from the Congress. And he was pretty arrogant about this, and that was unusual for his demeanor. He said, no, I don't need that. I have a U.N. resolution. <laughs> and uh, But he then, then the Congress, you know, for political reasons, he said, well, if they want to give me permission, let them have a resolution. So everybody was happy. The Congress got to participate in it, and they got the authority. But it didn't really serve as a declaration of war and didn't find out who the enemy was and never uh, had an end stage to the fighting that went on. This, you know, came, came home to me when you were doing 1146 to get the U.S. out of the U.N., and we got a lot of surprising, I, I thought, I guess I was naive, I thought that the conservatives would be on board. You know, the liberals, the left hated it because they liked the idea of world government, this sort of thing, but remember how the conservatives resisted, and they said, no, no, we don't want to get out of the U.N., we want to control the U.N. and force them to do what we want. Well, was, <clears throat> what was funny is they gave me support when we didn't have control of the House. Yeah. And then once we got control of the House, he said, Ron, we don't need you now. Yeah. <laughs> we, we were just <laughs> pretending. <laughs> he says, don't bring that resolution up. And uh, The foreign aid was the same thing. Yeah. And all the Republicans would vote against the foreign aid. Uh, and then uh, when they were in charge, they, they had to get different. this passed. But that's tradition. That fits into the argument I make that uh, the, there's only about one party there. Yeah, exactly. Here's another thing that I picked out, and again, it's not a laugh test, it's, it's a disgust test, I guess, but here's what he said. In America, we do not seek to impose our way of life on anyone, but rather to let it shine as an example for everyone to watch. And then in the same speech, he went on to say, the United States has taken important steps to hold the Venezuelan regime accountable. We're prepared to take further action. Uh, it's time for the entire world to join us in... <clears throat> 
deciding that it, demanding that Iran's government end its pursuit of death and destruction, and so on and so on. So he said, we don't push people around. Then he goes ahead and starts pushing everyone around. Yeah. Originally, it was the axis of evil, and they had the three country. But Iraq is not part of that anymore because we have total control. Of we've, it, we've liberated it. But now, <laughs> but now the axis has expanded to include other other countries, and uh, that, of course, is the problem. But you know. People who opposed the United Nations uh, from the very beginning understood, you know, what could happen. And uh, I became very much aware of it uh, very early on because, uh, and I remember it clearly, it was just five years after World War II ended and the war was starting up. And I remember the conversation or heard my mother speaking. I was all, well, at that time I'd probably be about 15. I heard her speaking, I don't know whether this country can stand just another war. She was just lamenting the fact that there'd be another war without going going into the details at all, but there it was. And where did that come from? The authority came from the United Nations. So in many ways, the seeds of all this mess, I lay at the doorstep of, of uh, world government because yeah. they went along with this and the UN was set up to bring peace uh, to the world. The first thing they did was start a war and they planted a lot of bad seeds in the Middle East as well. So th they're not a peacekeeping nation at all. They've give, they, they endorse the issue of sanctions, they endorse the war, they get the resolutions and they go on and not every once in a while they throw out a resolution, but how often do they pass a resolution against Saudi Arabia? Have they done much of that? <laughs> I don't think so. No, and, and you know, in addition, remember we talked about before in 2006 when they adopted the concept of responsibility to protect, R2P, which means if, if the nations get together and decide that one country is not doing enough uh, to protect its people or he's a rogue leader, then they feel like they have the authority, whereas it was for all of its faults, it was at least a imagined as a collection of sovereign nations who retain their sovereignty. That was about the only good thing about it. Yeah, and, and I think we're at a time, and this is an issue we've talked about before, is uh, that uh, we will and are in the process of overstepping our bounds. You know, uh, although we're still the kingpin, and although it's our empire, and although we have the reserve currency of the world, and although we can spend endless money, and uh, whether we have five trillion double to t ten trillion double to twenty trillion dollars in a short period of time, getting ready to double to forty trillion dollars, there's a limit, and uh, there's a limit to our foreign policy. There's a limit to us pushing people around, and I think there will not be an invasion of the United States. I think the fact that <laughs> they can beat the war drums and build up enough fear uh, in the American people. Right now, more than half the people think that we should attack North Korea, yeah. you know, like they were going to come here. And it makes no more sense than the lies they told us about Iraq. So they, 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 they push this and they build up the fear. But we build up a lot of enemies. And I think the attack on us will, can, will be on the dollar. And people are starting to prepare for this. You know, uh, it's, uh, it's a very fragile system. And there's a tremendous contrast contribution to that. There's a lot of other factors too. <laughs> the number one culprit being the Federal Reserve. But they are they were in collusion for this anyway. This, uh, this is how this gets financed. We couldn't have these deficits if you didn't have the Federal Reserve financing it. But I think it's it's coming to an end and we're overstepping our bounds. And that type of this type of speech we just heard is an example of bombast, you yeah. know, just saying saying that we are we are the exceptional Americans. We know what is best and put out a few phrases there that that uh, we are so kind and considerate and we can worry about your sovereignty and we want peace and prosperity. And um, I, I think that uh, the majority of American people, when you do some polling, you find out that the people are disgusted and uh, they are very distrustful of our government and rightfully so. And you say bombast and that's right. It almost smacks of desperation too, you know, because look, here's the United States that has essentially lost every war it's been in since World War II. It just lost Syria. Unfortunately, many thousands of others lost more than just a war. They lost their lives. Lost Syria, lost Afghanistan, it's lost Iraq, it's lost Libya. Here's a country that can't defeat uh, you know, a, a bunch of tribesmen in mountains in Afghanistan. It really does almost smack of desperation, or, you know, rattling the, the guns and, and threatening everyone. Well, in reality, it looks more like a paper tiger. Right, and uh, I, I think that um, people will realize that, but there'll be a lot of people who will love this speech. You know, the neocons are loving well, it. John Bolton and, was giddy. Yeah, you know? they're, they're Abrams very, was thrilled. very, very excited. So how would you like to summarize this, and uh, what do you expect uh, good to come of it? Uh, or is this uh, just another burden for us to bear? 
Well, I think his true colors have shown. I don't think anyone that even had some, some small hopes, myself included, that he might come around are feeling pretty desperate. But, you know, like in a good movie, they always have a bonus reel of, of, of things. And so I thought I would bring out a bonus reel. And here's Nikki Haley, uh, the greatest diplomat in the history of the universe. Here's what she tweeted after the speech. Um, uh, you know, if you remember, Saudi Arabia was on the Human Rights Commission, and oh, yeah. there was some. Um, here's what she said: Human rights are too important to let some of the worst abusers sit on the Human Rights Commission, UN Human Rights Commission. <laughs> and I think Saudi Arabia is involved in a war with us against the Yemenis. Yeah. You know. At the same time, uh, the last time the Iranians, who are the monsters, also, uh, the last time they were involved in a war was in 1980 and they were fighting Iraq when we promoted that we war promoted. and supported Iraq and when we essentially well that was a that, that was left as a stalemate but uh, certainly it wasn't a victory uh, you know for our side and the bigger picture here is something we've talked about uh, is also important. We talk about the individual thing, uh, uh, Korea and uh, Ukraine and all these other areas. But the big picture to me is us determined to be involved in the big fight between the Saudi faction and the Iranian faction. And uh, I think and that's Sunni Shia mm -hmm. and the West and the East and the Soviets and the U.S. And, and I think you can line up the ducks, a bunch of countries on one side and on, on the other. And it's almost like what, would, what it happens if they have a fight over there and we're not there. <laughs> and, and, they, and, it was, and we almost feel like we have to help get it started, you know, and, and provoke it. That to me is the sad part, but that's not going to go away. Uh, but it would be quieted down if we had a bit of a different attitude and a different approach. So I uh, was hopeful that the tone would be different and it, uh, that our president would be a little more calm about this situation because I think that uh, his presentation uh, is not what uh, we need. And, and some are critical uh, of it, rightfully so, but other Others will love it and I uh, think that uh, yes once again we're being threatened we need strong we need a strong president we want to be safe we don't want the North Koreans to come and invade us and take away our liberties well what you ought to really worry about is our own government taking away our liberties just think of what happened in the early part of this century the Patriot Act and the NDAA and all the uh, usurpation of our our civil liberties that's where the real concern is the uh, the invasion by a foreign power to destroy our liberty is not going to come in our lifetime. It's going to be the lack of confidence and desire to live in a free country and put the pressure on our own government to stay out of this entangling alliances, these useless wars that make no sense whatsoever, and uh, paying for them with printing press money, which is going to undermine the prosperity of this country. So. Stick with us because we're going to continue to support peace and prosperity. It's conceivable. It's understandable. I think the American people want it. I think the people of the world want it if they aren't influenced by the propagandists who promote war and conflict. Please look at it carefully because there is an answer to this mess that we're in and it's found in something that traditionally was very much in the American spirit. I want to thank everybody for tuning in today to the Liberty Report. Please come back soon.